Hello everybody, good afternoon. I'm, I apologize for that background noise and that technical difficulty, but thank you very much for joining us today um, for our official launch of our Environmental Courts and Tribunals Guide for Policymakers 2021. So as you may have known, um, in 2021, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, commissioned EPSEL, Asia, the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law, to undertake a global study on environmental courts and tribunals and to produce an updated guide for policymakers. So for this humongous project, EPSEL collaborated with Ghent University, UGent to create a comprehensive 128-page report on the status and associated developments of ECTs in over 190 countries in the world which have taken place since 2016. And in this guide, we also provided recommendations on how ECTs can be strengthened as a key institution for environmental justice in different parts of the world. So our guide was completed in 2021, and it's finally published this year. Um, so we thank you very much for joining us this afternoon at this official launch, and we hope you will enjoy hearing from UNEP, EPSEL, UGENT, and our review board member, Ms. Beatrice Garcia, about their insights and their thoughts on our research and our findings. So without further ado, um, I would like to uh, bring your attention to some, some housekeeping matters. So first of all, feel free to leave any questions in our Q&A box um, and use the Q&A box rather than the chat function. And secondly, we would like to encourage everybody to complete the feedback form at the end of this webinar session uh, so that we can take in all um, the feedback to improve future sessions. Thank you very much. So with all that said, um, let us now move to open our webinar uh, with opening remarks by the director of EPSEL, Dr. Jolene Lin. Jolene, please. Thank you, Celine. Um, thank you everyone for making the time to attend this webinar. Everyone speaks of webinar fatigue, and so I'm always very impressed and always happy that people are still making the time to celebrate with us and to join in conversations online. Um, the launch of this report is a, a, a significant milestone for the Asia Pacific Center uh, for Environmental Law. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to work with our colleagues at UNEP and Ghent University. Um, and I am very grateful and I'd like to express my utmost gratitude to everyone at Ghent University and UNEP for supporting the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law in completing the 2021 up, uh, update to the policy guide. I also like to express my gratitude to the authors of the 2016 guide, uh, Professors George and Catherine Prink for um, writing the foreword as well as contributing their insights into the issues and trends that they think we, they would have liked a 2021 report to have addressed. As the report, as the 2021 report, um, you know, uh, as shows, um, unlike the explosion of environmental courts and tribunals that was witnessed uh, and described in the 2016 report, what we see today is more um, a steady growth and a consolidation in the um, establishment of um, ECTs. And um, the focus was really trying to understand um, what are some of the best practices that have been adopted and what are some of the opportunities and challenges that have been presented to ECTs by um, the COVID pandemic, for example, uh, climate change, um, as well as um, growing um, inequality. Uh, these were some of the factors that uh, Professors George and Catherine Pring um, highlighted in their foreword. I also like to congratulate my colleague, Linda, for playing such a key role in leading the team and for painstakingly um, enduring uh, long hours to put together a very um, data intensive report so that, that was really, um, really kudos to her. And uh, finally, I also like to uh, uh, thank um, all the researchers at EPSEL, including pro bono researchers, 
Uh, Celine at that time was a pro bono researcher who has now joined us full time. Um, thank you very much all for um, contributing to the great work. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand the uh, floor over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jolene. And um, with that, um, I would like to please invite Mr. Arnold Krellhuber to give his remarks. He is the Deputy Director of the UNEP Law Division. So Arnold, please. Thank you very much, Celine and uh, Director Lin. It's a great uh, pleasure uh, to welcome you all on behalf of UNEP to this launch of the 2021 edition of the Environmental Courts and Tribunals Report, a Guide for Policymakers. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Director Lin has already said, this report is an updated report to the report that UNEP had issued in 2016 to continuously document the trends uh, with regards to environmental courts and, and tribunals. And I want to thank at the outset, uh, Director Lin, Linda and the entire team of uh, EPSEL, as well as Farah and the entire team at the Kent University for their tireless efforts spent in uh, drafting the publication. This has been, as Director Lin has said, uh, truly a monumental uh, effort to aggregate the data from so many countries and from ECTs around the world. We are equally grateful in this context to all the experts, including the over 80 judges who have immensely contributed their valuable expertise and knowledge to make this publication possible. The guide identifies good practices which we hope policymakers, judges, academics, and stakeholders involved in the adjudication of environmental disputes can apply for better environmental outcomes and the achievement of sustainable development goals. The guide highlights in particular the importance of independence and impartiality of ECTs to effectively address any grievance brought before them. This can be achieved by designing institutional management and uh, rules that ensure the independence and impartiality of ECT judges or decision makers, designing a transparent and merit-based selection criteria for judges, the provision of long-term tenure and security of tenure, safeguards against arbitrary removal of judges, safeguarding the means of fixing and reviewing remuneration and other conditions of service and the publication of decisions of the ECTs. These points speak to the fact that uh, Director Lin has already highlighted that we have seen as compared to the 2016 report, which has really documented a rapid increase in ECTs around the world, a consolidation of these courts and tribunals that uh, we have witnessed through this new report and that is uh, currently ongoing around the world. The guide uh, also does further underscore the increased need for flexibility of ECTs to be free from limitations of the general court system owing to the uh, specific nature of environmental uh, um, uh, arbitration and decision making before uh, courts and, and tribunals. It further identifies the need for having non-law decision makers involved, which uh, the court the, the report sorry highlights uh, allows for both trained judges and professionals with technical expertise to contribute as adjudicators. Again, paying tribute to the specific nature of environmental cases that these courts and tribunals deal with. Furthermore, the significance of transparent, open and competitive selection process for adjudicators is also identified in the report as a hallmark of an effective ECT. Good ECT should also incorporate alternative dispute resolution, including conciliation, early neutral evaluation, mediation and arbitration. A broad and comprehensive jurisdiction is yet another aspect of effective ECTs. Local standard report highlights should be broad and open as possible. ECD should also be mandated to issue a broad range of remedies. ECD should have adequate powers to enforce their own decisions and remedies. They should also incorporate an evaluation system to ensure quality and achievement uh, to and achieve improvements in ECT over time. They should also, of course, have adequate resources. And uh, so these recommendations, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are intended, there are many more, of course, in the report. This is just a brief, uh, a brief summation of some of the highlights and recommendations that the report includes, are intended to further uh, help in the consolidation of environmental courts and tribunals. 
and uh, subsequent speakers, I think, will hone in more on some of these specific recommendations that the court that the, that the report uh, entails. But besides identifying good practices, we hope the guide will provide valuable information to policymakers and citizens about the changing world of specialized environmental courts and tribunals, and also provide an enhanced database of the available adjudicative forums for environmental disputes, while noting that there is no one size fits all. That was another key finding that is further consolidated in this 2021 report that environmental courts and tribunals around the world pay tribute to the specific uh, judicial system, of course, within which they operate, but also uh, pay tribute to the cultural uh, environments that, uh, that they have established in. What will work best should be, open, should be explored in an open, transparent planning process that permits thorough analysis when establishing an environmental court or tribunal. Most importantly, the guide provides citizens and advocacy groups with options for the most appropriate forums for addressing some of the most complex environmental cases that exist today. Climate change, for example, involves intricate legal and factual issues, requiring decisions that are scientifically and technically informed and forcible and successful in both the short and long term. Such matters can be effectively adjudicated in an ECT as recent decisions in Australia's Land and Environment Court of New South Wales and other ECTs have shown. This is very encouraging, ECTs work. Indeed, the guide clearly demonstrate how environmental courts and tribunals significantly contribute to advancing the environmental rule of law. In other words, ECTs are essential to make sure that environmental laws have real meaning and consequences in practice. But it also acknowledges the, lead, the need that much more needs to be done and this steady progress in establishing courts and tribunals that we have seen since 2016 has now been overtaken by a consolidation effort around the world. And we hope that this report, as I have said, will help and contribute to the further consolidation of these efforts. For example, documentation of both ECTs and environmental cases is still weak across the world. There is an urgent need to enhance documentation efforts, which are crucial to track the development of, and performance of ECTs. Such data should also be made easily available to the public. Under the coordination of UNEP, we offer that stakeholders can work together to fulfill these needs. We may also need to increase our efforts in judicial training and networking, which have the potential of greatly improving adjudicators' perspectives towards environmental cases. Since the 2016 UNEP uh, report on environmental courts and tribunals was published, more judicial networks have been established globally, most notably also the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, which is an institute created by judges for judges. We therefore hope uh, finally that we can continue with our cooperation uh, to ensure that environmental courts and tribunals take their rightful place in the journey to realizing the 2030 development agenda. And on behalf of UNEP, we are certainly committed to further strengthening our engagement and our efforts in this regard with EPSEL, the University of Ghent, and all judges around the world uh, to make sure that we can, as I have said, further help in the consolidation and the impact that environmental courts and tribunals have around the world. With these few introductory remarks, I'm looking forward to a very interesting webinar and I want to thank again everybody who has joined for this webinar and uh, to say again that it has been a great pleasure to uh, collaborate with EPSEL, the University of Ghent, all the reviewers and uh, authors, the judges that have helped us review the report. It has been a true pleasure for, for UNEP to be able to put this updated uh, uh, report uh, out this year in such a great collaboration with so many interested parties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnold. And now we would like to invite Dr. Beatrice Garcia, Senior Lecturer of Western Sydney University, to give her opening remarks and her insights as a member of our review board. So Dr. Garcia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law at the National University of Singapore 
in particular, Dr. Linda Salistiavati and Associate Professor Jolene Lin, um, UNEP and University of Ghent for this invitation. Um, I thank for the honor to represent uh, the review board members uh, for the uh, Environmental Courts and Tribunals ECT Guide 2021. Um, and I'll start talking about the review board first. Um, the, the board was, uh, was uh, formed by a group of experts, um, including academics and judges, uh, who all took the time to review and read um, previous uh, drafts of the ECT guide and provide feedback prior to its publication. Feedback was also provided by uh, the law division of UNEP. And I would like you to show you a slide with the names of the board members. Um, so I'll share the screen with you. Right. So here you have the, the list of names of the uh, board members of the ECT 2021 guide. Um, how we worked, uh, we, um, as you, you know, we were, uh, as experts from different places, and we would meet to discuss the report, uh, not in Singapore, on another exciting place, but via Zoom, as uh, usual during COVID time. Um, and uh, this, this, the board allowed, uh, in, in my opinion, um, really the debates, the uh, participation of the academic community and practitioners, in the making of the ECT guide, it created debate involving the experience and expertise of different people. Uh, therefore, therefore, on behalf of the board members, I would like to thank you for the establishment of the review board. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the authors of the ECT guide. As you can see here, have a list of names again uh, for their fantastic work in um, researching and writing the guide, and also acknowledge the um, support that has been given by many institutions and stakeholders who were involved in this project and participated uh, in the research of the ECT guide. And now I'll stop sharing here. A few words about the content of the ECT guide. Um, as has been mentioned before, this has been a monumental, uh, the, a monumental work and has a very large scope. I have to say that when I got the first draft of the of the guide, I thought to myself, "That's not possible. It's too much." <laughs> but I was wrong. Um, you did a wonderful job, and uh, as you know, the report has many countries, many jurisdictions, and legal cultures, different languages various researchers involved. It covered a large period of time from 2016 to 2021, um, and there were many challenges. Um, there was not enough information of environmental courts and tribunals for some countries, or it was difficult to get reliable information for other countries. It was a challenge sometimes to identify the right people to talk to, and also a uh, challenge was to being able to provide a specific detailed picture of uh, the status of ECTs without overwhelming the reader with too much information. About the positives of the ECT guide, we now have an up-to-date picture of the status and global distribution of ECTs. We have more knowledge about environmental jurisprudence globally, and we know also more about good practices that can inspire environmental courts and tribunals around the world. We know about current trends in terms of numbers of ECTs and environmental cases, and we have a better understanding of new features, for example, the use of alternative dispute resolution methods. A few words about challenges ahead, and maybe Linda and the other authors won't be very happy to hear that. But probably in a few years' time, we will need another update of the ECT guide, um, and we'll probably face very similar problems. It will be difficult to collect information, um, identify and connect with the right stakeholders, 
it will be probably challenging to compile, compile information and work with a large amount of information, most of which require uh, an effort of translation, not only of foreign languages to English or French, but also translation of different legal cultures and practices. So these will probably be uh, challenges that we'll face in the future. Um, as stated in the guide, and as Arnold was mentioned, mentioning before as well, um, the, the guide um, identifies that problem with documentation of both ECTs and environmental cases, which is still weak across the world. And using the words of the guide, um, there is an urgent need to improve documentation efforts, which are crucial to track the development and performance of ECTs. This data should be available to the public, right? So the problem of not perhaps not having enough information is that we may not know enough about environmental courts and tribunals still today about what they do, what they have achieved, and what has been what needs to be done to improve environmental justice globally. In this context, I, I would say that UNEP has an important role to play in collaboration with environmental um, judges, uh, organizations, academics, in really creating a platform and forum where uh, we can have a comprehensive data uh, about ECTs and their work that could be available to the public and also regularly updated. This will be beneficial to all of us, judges, environmental organizations, academics, and students. So this is, I think, something that should be um, thought for the future. To conclude with the 2021 ECT guide, we now have a much better idea about what needs to be done to improve access to environmental justice and to better support judges and tribunals uh, globally. Again, I would like to thank EPSEL at the National University of Singapore, uh, the University of Ghent, UNEP, all the authors and the many institutions involved in this monumental effort uh, to bring this essential knowledge about uh, courts and tribunals to all of us. Thank you very much and thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. Um, now we would like to pass the mic and the floor to Dr. Linda Yanti Sulistiawati. She is our research, our senior research fellow at EPSEL and also an associate professor at Universitas Gajamaja in Indonesia. She was our lead author for this monumental ECT project, and she will be speaking about the current status of ECTs in Asia, Oceania, and the and the Pacific, and the Americas, and the Caribbean. So with that, Dr. Celestia Wati, um, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good day for those of you who are in the other part of the world. I would like to share my screen. Um, just let me know if this is uh, feasible for you. Can you see it, uh, Celine? Is this OK? Yes, all good. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, everybody in this case, uh, from Arnold uh, and all the UNEP uh, Law Division team uh, that has been very supportive to us. Uh, you know, day and night, I would email Alan and Andrew and asking for <laughs> all the crazy things that we ask for. Uh, me and Farah uh, are always bothering them uh, during 2021. So um, I bet all of you are also as relieved as we are here <laughs> to be able to finally you know, launch the uh, Environmental Courts and Tribunal Guide for Policymakers 2021. So um, on behalf of uh, the researchers in APSEL, we were like a big uh, team uh, having to tackle all these areas uh, outside Europe and Africa because uh, the U UGENT team is tackling Europe and Africa. Uh, we would like to, you to, uh, would like to invite you to read the guide and uh, please give us uh, inputs uh, if you may. 
because this is like a, a work of a, a village, you know, like because we needed uh, inputs and we needed to have contacts and we listed everything in the report. If you need any contacts, if you need anything, any experts on ECTs in certain regions or certain countries, you can go to this report and scroll down to the appendix and you'll find them uh, name and email address. So, and we have their consent to have the, <laughs> the report. So in, in this uh, short time, we'll try to give you like a skeletal, skeletal presentation of uh, the report. Of course, it's not going to be uh, extremely complete, uh, but it's downloadable in the UNEP's website. And I saw it also on the chat uh, box, the link, you can easily download it uh, anywhere from anywhere in the world. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Again, as uh, the uh, previous uh, remarks from Jolene, Arnold, and Beatrice have already highlighted, this is an update from the 2016 guide that was, you know, um, uh, already widely read everywhere, by, uh, and written by Professor Prings and Prings. And uh, it was very hard for us to also um, uh, at that time to make the first step. So where do we go from here? Because we were in the midst of COVID, we couldn't go anywhere. Everybody was like, we didn't even meet uh, our researchers until later, you know, that that year because everybody was in lockdown. Uh, but uh, we managed to, you know, try to do everything, the methodologies, uh, you can, read it in the reports and how we did survey and also in-depth uh, uh, interviews. Uh, we pretty much did everything online. So thank God for the internet. So uh, there were uh, 1500 plus ECTs in 2016 uh, and the number of ECTs uh, has grown in 2021 uh, to 2,115 in, in 67 countries. So uh, with this, we see a higher conviction rates, higher environmental cases in all regions, you know, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, the ones that we can get like uh, uh, numbers on uh, the cases. Uh, we also highlight like why not all countries have ECTs in the report. We see social, political, economic, and jurisdictional challenges. Uh, if you can see on your screen now, the map here is the global distribution of ECT. The blue part of the world are the countries that already have established uh, ECTs and the rest are, you know, whether um, the countries would, you know, used to have ECT and they have discontinued it. Uh, they, they have uh, an authorized ECT, but not established. Uh, so it's authorized, but not established or pending ECTs. So um, uh, we sampled uh, 137 countries. We wanted to have like all the UN member countries, but uh, as Beatrice highlighted, it was not as easy as you know, as you think it would. We would send like hundreds of emails and not getting anything back. And you know, we were uh, trying our contacts in several places in the world and you know, even I don't think uh, some some of the emails didn't even get you know read by <laughs> by anyone. <laughs> so yeah, so this this is like we did the best we could, and um, and then uh, we analyzed with what we have uh, the data that we could uh, uh, extract it from the survey, from the interview, and also uh, the available data online and on uh, previous publications. So countries develop their ECTs based on their needs for environmental jurisprudence, uh, while also taking into account their flexibility of their legal framework. Some countries have massive ECTs development like China, for example, uh, where more than 1,353 ECTs were established since 2016. Uh, some already have ECTs and they maintain their ECTs like India and Pakistan. And some uh, decided to establish green benches. So uh, 
some call it ECT, some call it, you know, just general court with green judges sitting in the bench, um, like in Indonesia and uh, in, in Pakistan and Thailand. So the challenges uh, of these ECTs, uh, you know, some has lack of governmental and uh, stakeholder support. So the government does establish the ECT, but they don't, you know, fully support it and not, not, you know, not heavy on the facility, not heavy on um, uh, 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 other kinds of support, including political support. Uh, and that leads to, you know, non-prioritization of ECTs issues. So typically we see this in developing countries uh, where their focus is more on other things than environmental issues. Uh, and then uh, in information technology or IT infrastructure, we see uh, some developing countries like India and, and, and Pakistan, for example, are, are very forward in terms of how their um, environmental court, environmental tribunals can function really well online. Uh, while in other places, uh, you know, even the structure is not there. And so it's very hard to, for them, for their ECTs to operate during the pandemic. And then uh, there's also this one that we see a lot also in developing countries in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, even in ASEAN countries, lack of enforcement of environmental legislation. Uh, we observe ECT observations in 2021. Uh, there are 2,115 operational ECTs in 67 countries. You may go to Appendix A of the report. And uh, this trend is due to several factors, including the increased effectiveness of, of existing environmental courts and environmental tribunals, the prioritization of environmental issues in general courts, and the presence of judges who are well-versed in environmental matters. The increased numbers uh, of environmental cases in general courts also reflect the widespread belief that environmental justice can be achieved through existing system. This is uh, quoted uh, during the interview with uh, Judge uh, Shah uh, from Pakistan. And this is what we found as driving factors of the ECTs. We see like vibrant civil society that want to have, you know, understood the need of ECTs and have pressures to have ECTs. And then there's also like climate litigation that Jolene earlier mentioned. Um, uh, you know, climate and environmental cases are piling up in courts. And then human rights issues. Recently, the UNGA even adopted a resolution saying that uh, it's the human right to have, you know, uh, uh, healthy living conditions. And so, you know, the nexus between uh, human rights and environmental environment is very, very strong now. And then we have international environmental law principles that was, you know, always there and always help helping ECTs. And UNEP leadership is also very important. Uh, the presence in, you know, of UNEP, whether they are in developing or developed countries can, you know, always give a push uh, for ECT to flourish. Uh, because, because like it or not, I think UNEP is right there in the leadership of, you know, the environmental issues of the world. It's the face. Uh, sorry to give you more burden, Arnold. But <laughs> and then international finance um, institutions, they also play a very important role. Uh, for example, we see um, the in Asian Development Bank uh, are giving uh, global judges uh, trainings for judges, routine training, even during the pandemic. Um, they have been doing it for like quite some time now. Uh, you know, even since 2016 to 2021, we see a lot of uh, judges training on environmental issues are still being conducted through, uh, through the internet uh, online. And then also uh, impacts of COVID-19. Um, some of us are thinking, you know, this is like very bad. But on the other hand, then we see how much environmental cases have flourished during that pandemic time. 
and how ECTs, you know, the ones that are ready can, you know, manage all of these cases and, 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 and came out, you know, as winners uh, of, uh, with environmental jurisprudence that are very important uh, uh, for their country and for the world. And then we are also honing in on the judges training and networking. Uh, we see here that, you know, you see like blue and orange, blue as countries with ECTs and orange uh, as countries without uh, ECTs and, uh, and how um, we, we uh, survey how many countries needed uh, prior experience uh, for judges in environmental adjudication prior experience in environmental matters, um, whether judges get scientific trainings or, you know, other, other stuff. So, uh, which means they don't get training, they just learn on the job. So this is also very interesting to see uh, <clears throat> because in one hand, we see a lot of environmental cases coming in, but on the other hand, uh, uh, profile and experience of judges with environmental prior knowledge is somehow, uh, you know, still very lacking. So need, uh, we need to work on this. And then these are uh, the good practices. I think some of our earlier speakers already highlighted for ECTs. Uh, it's very important for the ECTs to have independence, uh, flexibility, non-law decision makers, and then uh, adjudicators, selection and training, and then also ADR, alternative dispute resolution, and then comprehensive jurisdiction, which we will uh, discuss uh, more uh, later on. And then standing, uh, flexible standing is always helping. Uh, and then remedies, what type of remedies that can be achieved, evaluation procedures and adequate resources. So, you know, when ECTs, uh, have all of this, you know, that's uh, very ideal for an ECT to have all of this. Uh, some, some ECTs just have two or three, uh, but still they can survive. So um, yeah, so the good practices characteristics that we see uh, around the world are ECTs that uh, have all of this support. So um, in China, for example, one of the good practices they have in ECTs uh, is uh, that they have transparency for environmental adjudication, mod model environmental cases published annually by the Supreme People's Court, and then disclosure and public participation, uh, OPPO trial system where live trials are broadcast in uh, on China open trial website, uh, WeChat and also on Weibo. And then uh, public representatives and students have also been invited to attend cases with significant impacts within their jurisdiction, promoting the transparency and openness of environmental education. And then from India, of course, this is like the uh, uh, postcard uh, picture for ECTs is the NGT, National Green Tribunal in India, uh, which have uh, accessible and broad standing rule that individual can go directly to court without even a lawyer, that persons may bring claim in the public interest even if they have no direct personal connection to the matter. And a person may bring claim on behalf of a group of people, such as all those uh, living in a village or uh, Fisher folk reliant on a certain fishery matter, uh, fishery matter, uh, or, or um, even the court has a motion that's called suomotu, where they can bring their own motion uh, to the court. So um, as as uh, 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 as a as a uh, result, uh, NGT has also provided good environmental jurisprudence for India. For example, the impact assessment and restitution became um, important parts of the Indian law. But uh, ECTs uh, are also accompanied by green benches. For example, in Pakistan, uh, although they have environmental tribunals uh, in Pakistan, uh, but they are also strengthening their general court 
uh, judges with environmental training. Uh, so they would have uh, designated green judges to sit uh, presiding over environmental related cases. We see this in Indonesia, for example, uh, due to political challenges and capacity constraints, the policymakers there decided to give general court judges environmental training instead. Uh, this has contributed to the goal of having judges who are proficient in environmental issues within general courts and, and some even technical, very, very environmental, like technical uh, trainings where the judge are, 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 are trained to read a GIS map of, of where the hotspots of forest fires have uh, uh, occurred, et cetera. So in Indonesia, uh, once the judges are trained and then they were given certification, so, so the court would know that these are green judges who are sitting in the green bench. Uh, similar in Thailand, uh, Thailand court and government organized general specific training uh, uh, courses for its general court judges for environmental matters and regularly provide scholarship to judges to study environmental law abroad. These green benches may not be fully capable to uh, incorporate uh, best practices that ECT can provide, but sometimes the countries have to deal with other matter first and uh, but still have to uh, manage their environmental cases. So green benches is you know somehow an alternative that you know they can uh, bear. So for comprehensive jurisdiction, when we're talking about good practices, um, in, uh, in terms of geographic uh, jurisdiction, ECT judges and decision maker can travel for site visits and hearing on site. We see this in Queensland, Australia, and in New Zealand, or uh, there are also what we call, what they call mobile courthouses, where airplanes, buses, boats, and fans have been outfitted as mini mobile courthouses in the Philippines and also in the Amazon Brazil. Uh, subject matter, ju uh, matter jurisdiction, uh, it's, it is good practice to give ECT the ability to adjudicate civil, criminal, and administrative issue together because environmental disputes uh, frequently involve more than one, if not all three, usually even all three uh, of these aspects. Good practice from India and the Philippines is the use of uh, express statutory authority to apply constitutional law and uh, international environmental law principles in the adjudication process. Uh, level of jurisdiction, we've seen this in Pakistan and China where uh, that they have created uh, environmental courts or green benches in all three level uh, trial appeal in Supreme Court. And then we also, um, reiterate, sorry, we also reiterate what uh, has already been discussed in 2016 uh, ECT guide, uh, which are, you know, EC ECT's models. In uh, four environmental courts, we see uh, there are like five uh, different types of uh, ECs of environmental courts, uh, operationally independent, decisionally independent, mix of law trained and science trained uh, judges, uh, general court designated judges and general court trained in environmental law. Uh, and then for uh, environmental tribunals, uh, we have operationally independent environmental tribunals that are separated fully or largely independent environmental tribunal, decisionally uh, independent environmental tribunal uh, that are under uh, another agency supervision, but not uh, the one whose decision they review, so, you know, and then captive uh, environmental tribunal within the control of the agency whose decision they review. Uh, aside from uh, these models, we also see uh, other types such as environmental ombudsman, uh, prosecutors and commission. Uh, the ombudsman we see in Austria, New Zealand, Hungary, uh, Kenya, and Greece, maybe Farah will, uh, We'll, we'll discuss more on this. And then uh, for prosecutors, uh, for example, most countries in Latin America have specialized environmental prosecution offices, uh, both in countries with or without ECTs. Like in Brazil, they have very strong uh, prosecutors for the environment. 
and then uh, also human rights commissions. Uh, human rights commission is an international, national, or subnational government body uh, set up to investigate, hold hearings, and protect human rights. Some human rights commissions cover environmental rights, particularly if the country's constitution includes a right to have a healthy environment or the right to, li to life. This is because the close relationship between human rights and environmental rights. So, um, and then if you go uh, uh, through the reports and you go to the appendix, you'll see detailed, um, detailed uh, numbers of ECTs of each countries and the updates that we could find since, since 2016. We uh, have this for the Caribbean, uh, Central America, and then North America, and South America. You see the numbers of uh, most uh, ECTs are uh, found in Brazil. And then um, New, Ze New Zealand, Australia, and Oceania. Um, you know, Australia, of course, have very strong ECTs. Uh, New Zealand also have very strong ECTs. And the Pacific is, uh, um, some of the Pacific Island countries have ECTs, but uh, it's very, very hard for us to get information uh, from uh, the Pacific uh, Island countries. So if you're from the Pacific and you have uh, information on the ECTs, we'd love to uh, hear from you. Um, and then uh, for Asia, as you can see, China is very big number. Uh, and then um, the Middle East also very hard for us to get information on uh, it's, it's, it's the absence of ECT is the dominant trend in the region. Uh, there's one uh, established but uh, authorized but not established ECT in UAE um, and in the Turkey is thinking about ECTs but other countries it's very hard to find information in the Middle East and West, in West Asia. And then for uh, Southeast Asia, as you can tell, uh, there's uh, 134 of environmental courts in Malaysia, um, uh, the Philippines, uh, 117. Uh, this has uh, already been there since uh, 2016, I think. So uh, other than that, we have, uh, we have no update for Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm not going to conclude because uh, Farah, my colleague, is going to uh, explain uh, to you what she found as updates from the areas of Europe and Africa. Thank you so much. Back Thank you very time. much. Thank you very much, Linda. And now we would like to invite Ms. Farah Bukel, a researcher from UGENT, um, to present her findings on the ECTs in the regions of Africa and Europe. So Farah, please. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And hello from Belgium. Um, thank you, Absel, Linda, and her team for your uh, help during the writing process, and also to UNEP, um, the review board members, but I would like to stress that um, we are very thankful to all the judges and environmental experts mentioned in the guide. Uh, without your input, put this uh, guide or the update, update of the guide would not have been possible. So I will now show you some slides about our research for the regions of Africa and Europe. For UGENT, um, I work as a teaching assistant and I'm also the coordinator of the European Network of Judges for the Environment. And together with Emeritus Professor Luc Lavresen, uh, whom many of you will know. He is the president of our constitutional court in Belgium, and he's also the president of the European Network of Judges for the Environment. We did some research on Europe and Africa. So in Africa, it was a bit difficult to obtain uh, responses. We obtained 22 uh, information from 22 countries um, on 57 countries. Um, 
sorry, I must go back. Uh, we did write to a maximum of environmental law experts, judges, UNEP contacts, um, but it was difficult to obtain um, information as well as for the other regions. And um, in the next years, yes, further research would be very useful. So compared to the numbers of the 2016 guide, the number of ECTs has also slightly increased in Africa. In 21, there are about 62 EC, uh, environmental courts and 21 environmental tribunals in 12 countries of Africa. So on the African continent, we can say that there is a, an emerging trend of creating ECTs and that it is for this moment limited to some countries. The most developed and eye-catching environmental court is of course the Kenyan Environment and Land Court. Um, it has now uh, environment and land courts in 26 of the 47 counties of Kenya with 51 judges. And although it handles mostly land matters, it has developed uh, sound jurisprudence in environmental matters about its own competence, about locus standi, about the, the constitutional right to a healthy environment, about public participation and so on. Kenya also has a national environmental tribunal, the NET, which handles appeals against environmental permit decisions and decisions of the National Environmental Management Authority. It is part of the judiciary now. And Kenya also has an environmental ombudsman, the National Environmental Complaints Committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is an environmental ombudsman. It can make recommendations on the um, environmental policy. It can conduct investigations and also a public interest litigation on behalf of citizens in environmental matters. So Kenya is a country where different models of ECTs and an ombudsman exist. Then we found land courts in Ghana. These are divisions of the high courts. There are land courts in Lesotho, and there is also a um, land court in Burundi, but these mainly handle land matters. We did mention these because Professor Mekuwar, who I interviewed, he told me that they had to be mentioned because in Africa, of course, the land and the national resources attached to it are inextricably linked with environmental matters because the land is traditionally owned by the community. New since the 2016 guide is a special court for the fight against ebony and rosewood trafficking in Madagascar. It has nationwide competence for these issues and also abroad uh, for um, crimes committed abroad in relation to rosewood and ebony trafficking. And then we have 21 operational environmental tribunals. They are mainly competent for land and planning and water, such as, for example, the water tribunals in South Africa and Kenya. There are planning tribunals in Nigeria and Zambia. And then you have in Mauritius an Environment and Land Appeals Tribunal, the Eluat, which has broader competence in environmental matters. Here you can see this Environmental Tribunal in Mauritius in action during a hearing. There is an exciting um, project in Ethiopia, a draft proclamation for the establishment of a federal environmental tribunal, which would have a broad uh, jurisdiction and would be independent. Um, it would become operational, let's cross fingers, in 23, and it will have a mixed composition of law trained judges and technical experts. It has been inspired on ECT models in Australia, in India and Kenya, and this shows that good practices and existing ECTs are um, a source of inspiration for um, other countries and other continents. Uh, the emphasis will be on electronic proceedings, smooth rules of procedure, um, on alternative dispute resolution, on interim relief, on practical procedures. So 
uh, very curious and um, let's hope that this uh, federal environmental tribunal in Ethiopia will become a reality. In Africa, then you have a long list of environmental courts or tribunals which have been authorized in the law, but which have not yet or, uh, been established in practice. Um, you have these in Liberia, Malawi, Niger. Uh, there are land courts, rural land tribunals in Niger. And for example, a water tribunal uh, authorized in Namibia, but these have not been um, established yet. So we think this shows a need and much interest and also political will for uh, creating ECTs in Africa, but then there seem to be economic or social, political or jurisdictional obstacles to establish them in practice. And um, as Linda told, uh, the African continent is in this respect not different from the other countries. Uh, not all countries have ECTs because of social, political or economic difficulties to establish them. If establishing environmental courts and tribunals is difficult for whatever reasons, uh, we think that an alternative is um, maybe the training of general court judges. And in this respect, we mentioned in the guide, uh, UNEP in collaboration with the African Judicial Training Institutes has developed a guide, a training curriculum for magistrates in Africa. It, is, uh, it contains the minimum course content on environmental law for magistrates, and it is available online in three different languages, because indeed, um, large part of Africa and the African judiciary is French speaking. So it would be very um, interesting if our guide could be translated to French as the 2016 guide has been because um, during our research, we really, we had to translate the questionnaire to French because otherwise we couldn't reach a big part of Africa. Um, let's turn to Europe. Um, here you can see the total number of uh, ECs and ETs in Europe, 70 environmental courts, at least we counted and nine operational um, environmental tribunals in 42 of the surveyed countries. Europe is a bit uh, atypical. It has not really operationally independent environmental courts. Um, you see two things. You see uh, two models. The first one are specialized chambers within general courts and administrative courts. Um, their specialization has developed uh, on an informal, in an informal way because files or environmental cases are being systematically referred to the same chamber. And um, in this way, the judges train themselves or they become experts on the job. Uh, but the thing is that these chambers also handle other non-environmental matters and the judges can be transferred to other chambers. But they perform the function of environmental courts and they can get really specialized. For example, the first chamber of the Supreme Administrative Court in Finland has members who are environmental law professors and also has technical judges who are scientists or engineers. Um, but this chamber also handles data protection and asylum cases. So these chambers, and then on the slide, you can see other examples of these chambers in uh, Bulgaria, in Italy, in Spain, um, in Greece. The Dutch Council of State has an Omgevingskamer, an environmental chamber, chamber who, uh, which handles all the environment and planning um, cases. So these chambers can get very specialized, but they are established on an informal basis. Uh, this, I, this is a decision of the court's president or of the court's assembly. And we think that it would be good to uh, guarantee the specializations more structurally and in the long term, if um, this specialization would be anchored in the law. 
A second model that we see in Europe are administrative courts or administrative appeal bodies, which have a more restricted competence for handling appeals against fines, permit decisions under specifically listed environmental legislation. For example, the Vasa Administrative Court in Finland handles all the appeals under the Finnish Water Act and Environmental Protection Act. And you have similar environmental tribunals in Ireland, in Denmark, in uh, Belgium also. And the most far reaching form or degree of specialization are the land and environment courts in Sweden. They are part of the general court system and they have administrative and civil competence, but not criminal in environmental matters. You have five land and environment courts across the Swedish uh, territory, and then a land and environment court of appeal in Stockholm. And remarkable for these Swedish environmental courts is that they have a mixed composition. Law trade judges sit on the bench with technical judges and they decide on equal foot. According to a technical judge we interviewed um, in Sweden, who is now retired, he says the advantage of technical judges in the bench in environmental matters is that they can ask the right questions in these environmental matters, which tend to get very technical um, uh, from a scientific um, point of view. So they are up to date with the latest standards and techniques in science and technology, and they they understand what case the case is about. And this is something you cannot ask or expect from uh, law trained judges um, mastering the environmental law and the, the different levels of national environmental law, uh, European and international law is already a challenge. Here you can see the Vasa court in Finland on a field inspection. And this is a picture of a hearing of the Raad voor Vergunningsbetwisting in, in Belgium. It is a specialized administrative environmental court and it handles all the appeals against environmental and planning permits. Yes, here in Belgium, we have different degrees of um, environmental specialization. We have this independent environmental administrative courts. We have an environmental tribunal for the Brussels capital region. And then we have informal specialization. We have uh, some chambers in our Council of State who handle all the environment and planning cases, uh, but this is not um, provided for in the law. It is a decision of the first president of our Council of State. And these chambers also handle um, non-environmental cases. And this, for example, is um, the pronouncement of a judgment in a bulky, as you can see, a bulky um, case of fraud in the meat industry. Um, pronounced by criminal judges in a normal criminal section of our first instance court in Ghent. Uh, they handle other non-environmental uh, criminal cases as well. And this is sometimes a very challenging combination. So we hope that um, the first president in, um, of the Ghent court will uh, officially designate an environmental chamber it is possible in the law, but it is not mandatory and it has not happened, unfortunately, but we are hopeful. We also have some pending environmental courts within the general court system in Europe, and most of them are in France. Uh, December 20 law has created 36 um, specialized sections within the first instance court. So, for the territory of each of the 36 courts of appeal, one um, first instance court or one chamber in the first instance court will be responsible for the most complex environmental cases. Mo the most complex in terms of technicity, in terms of a geographical scope and or in terms of um, the importance of the environmental damage. So these uh, environmental courts, these new poles, they call it in France, um, with a long uh, name of 
pôles régionaux spécialisés en matière d'atteinte à l'environnement, they are under construction. The Ministry of Justice in France has created a guide, a script for establishing these um, pilot, uh, these environmental courts, and they started with three pilot courts, one in Marseille, one in Paris, and one in Coutances, if I'm um, not mistaken. And yes, this is being implemented uh, incrementally. So no new structures will be created and no specific budget has been set aside. So let's see how this will work in practice. And in Ireland, there are also plans to create a planning and environmental law courts as a separate list in the high court. It would have specialist judges and its own rules of procedure. Um, it is expected in the beginning of 23. So the main conclusion of our research is that one, environmental specialization and training of judges, but also prosecutors is really necessary in view of the legal and scientific complexity of environmental cases. Two, whatever model you choose, and however broad the jurisdiction of an environmental court, we think that the main problems or obstacles to the effectiveness of environmental courts and tribunals are, as Mr. Kreilhuber said, adequate resources. So sufficient capacity, sufficient judges and registrars and a sufficient budget. And this is a challenge for both existing and potential ECTs across the globe, also in Europe. Third, we think that specialization and cooperation are necessary, not only for the judges, but for all the actors of what we call here in Europe, the environmental enforcement chain, which goes from police to inspectors, to prosecutors and to judges. And this is why in Europe, we have these networks, a network of environmental judges, a network of environmental prosecutors, a network of environmental regulators and a network of uh, environmental police. These are NGOs and we organize uh, joint conferences, training and activities um, for networking, I hope, or maybe this can be um, a source of inspiration for other continents. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bukel. And with that, we have had all our panelists speak, um, speaking already. And I would just like to thank all of them once again for their very informative presentations. So with all of that completed, we will now be moving into our Q&A segment. So we do have some very interesting questions that have been posed. And this is just a reminder to our audience um, that if you would like to pose a question, please feel free to use the Q&A box um, and we will try and get to it either live or um, in the chat. So the first question that I would like to pose, I think this goes to Arnold, um, Linda and Farah because you all represent UNEP, EPSEL and uh, UGENT. So I will be combining two questions. So our question, comes from Judge Meredith Wright and also Ben Boer. So I think the gist of this question would be, what is, what is the future of this research going to look like? So Judge Meredith Wright wanted to know, will you be considering further research on subnational ECTs in federal countries? Um, and also Ben Boer wanted to know if, um, EPSEL, UNEP, UGENT, anyone would be filling the information gaps um, as we go along and as we, as we find out a bit more about these different jurisdictions or as the ECTs develop in these jurisdictions. Okay, I think, um, can I start, Celine? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. So uh, thank you for the questions. I think for Prof uh, Ben Boer and for Judge uh, Wright, uh, both of them were our um, 
very esteemed uh, 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 resource persons. Uh, Prof. Boer is actually uh, one of our review board also. Uh, so he knew uh, uh, the struggle of us getting all the data together. That's probably why he asked the question. Um, that's very valid. And um, I think uh, the uh, most dilemmatic uh, uh, thing for us is to consider resources and support for doing so, because it's very hard uh, for us to keep track uh, of ev the, everything that is going on uh, with, you know, with just uh, with the human resources and uh, all types of resources that we have in Epsel. And also you get, I can imagine, you know, what Farah and colleagues have to do there to cover the, you know, two big continents. Um, uh, as as per, uh, as per 2023, we're hoping to write um, um, for ECTs in the region, uh, that is Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we're hoping to publish this with Braille in 2023. Uh, we already have like the first activity, I think last week, <laughs> a webinar last week on the book uh, with all the authors. Um, and so, um, uh, momentarily, I think we will uh, prioritize the book first, uh, but we are, uh, we are always open to discuss about other things that would uh, uh, possibly materialize. Uh, I, think, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's what we can uh, uh, share with you at the moment. Thank you, and uh, Arno, Farah, would you like to add anything to that? Sarah, um, would yes. you like to go first? Please. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Kreinhuber. No, 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 go ahead, Farah. No, I just wanted to uh, confirm what Linda says, and it would be, it would have been nice to be able to interview persons physically. I'm sure that we would have um, gotten much more information. Um, here, our experts had to complete a very tough and long questionnaire. It's all, not always. Uh, everything was done online, and um, you can you can imagine that people got really uh, tired of doing everything online. Um, so I think it would be a great added value if we could um, meet persons, judges, or environmental law experts physically, either in their countries or at a conference. Um, and we, from our side at UGent, we have limited resources, but we are. Um, we are contributing to a book about sustainable development in Africa, and we are Professor Lavresen and I are writing to our, all our experts in in Africa um, whether there is already um, whether the information about their countries in the guide is still up to date, and we are definitely following up on the pending um, environmental courts and tribunals um, that are mentioned in the guide. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. And let me just say very quickly what excellent presentations, uh, Linda and Farah, for presenting, uh, you know, the report uh, in such a succinct but yet comprehensive fashion. And uh, uh, Meredith and Ben, um, you've been allies of this work for for many many years, uh, and it's great to to see you online for this uh, for this launch. Um, you perhaps know where the challenges lie. But it's still good that uh, that you insist on these on these issues. I would uh, tend to think that the environmental law field in general is a little bit slow in terms of catching up with the digital transformation. So the data gaps uh, that we see in this work, uh, you know, are replicated in other fields as well, where we see, for instance, in in uh, environmental litigation in general, uh, we have similar challenges to provide accurate, up-to-date uh, data for climate litigation, which, uh, you know, we've also tried to build partnerships around to help uh, to help us as UNEP uh, fulfill that role, to provide the world with accurate data on, uh, on environmental litigation. So it's not unique to environmental courts and tribunals, but I believe 
what these two reports now have shown is that there is an increasing demand uh, for not only judges, but also policymakers and the public at large to have information about environmental courts and tribunals because environmental issues are increasingly at the fore of policy discussions, but also of legal discussions. And, uh, you know, we just had recently the UN General Assembly uh, decide uh, on, on the right to a human, on, on the right uh, to a healthy environment. Uh, these developments will only further increase the need. So, Long story short, we from UNEP, we are committed uh, to, uh, to keep doing this work and uh, keep doing it better as we move along to provide accurate, more comprehensive data readily available for all stakeholders. But as both Linda as Farah has said, uh, it's also a resource question. So uh, what we would really uh, think um, as, um, as the most uh, viable options going forward is to build on the networks we have. Uh, and that's why I highlighted the excellent cooperation uh, around the second report uh, with, with all the partners, reviewers uh, involved, and also the judges, I think, increasingly play a role to advocate for uh, this specialized expertise. Uh, Farah, in a couple of your slides, you have highlighted, uh, you know, the enormous uh, caseloads that judges have already. And if uh, environmental cases are just an add-on, uh, this probably will not enhance environmental rule of law because the, both reports have also shown how complex environmental cases are. And so um, if judges can also help us advocate uh, for more trainings, uh, data, knowledge, sharing of experiences, uh, we have had a lot of feedback in UNEP on these two reports also uh, from uh, the perspective of cross-regional exchanges, right? Where um, and I saw one comment in the chat that Africa is lagging behind. Um, there are lots of traditional networks in Africa uh, that, um, that we have worked with that have also highlighted a need for specialized expertise. I think ultimately, as we have seen also in other regions, it done comes down to administrative considerations, financial considerations. And, and of course, key in all of this is the independence of, of judges. This is also something that UNEP also always highlights when we work with judges, it's uh, always at their request and, uh, and we are uh, providing a service and uh, a key role for UNEP uh, also with these two reports is to bring this to the attention of policymakers, um, parliamentarians, politicians at large, because they are essentially, you know, holding, uh, holding down uh, the, the uh, uh, the, the, the coffers of, of the resources. And so we need them also to be aware that environmental courts and tribunals can work. So it's, a, it's I think, a multifaceted approach. But just to say that we are in UNEP, we are committed, we are aware of the fact that uh, we need to put uh, more emphasis on, on uh, data collection and availability of data. But it's a, it's a long-term process and it needs uh, uh, all of you probably on that call uh, involved to, to make sure that we can collectively achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold. And yes, indeed, it is a it is a very difficult and and complicated problem, which you know we we really try to peel into with the two guides. So with that, um, I think you also answered another question that we had about what UN might be doing and the potential for. Um, building capacities across networks. So we've finished that question there. Uh, one person would like to know, Linda, um, if I think this question is for you because Farah has kindly answered it on the chat. Uh, but one person would like to know for the ECTs that have been um, discontinued, uh, what were the pertinent reasons that might have been given? Um, would you like to share your insights about um, this phenomenon in the, the areas that you covered. Yes, thanks, Elaine. So for the ECTs that have been discontinued, it's for a plethora of reasons. Uh, as we've written in the, in the guide, uh, it can be, you know, it's not being prioritized anymore in environmental uh, cases there. And then it can be like, there's no, uh, political will from the government to continue the ECTs. Uh, they think that it's uh, probably easier to just 
put everything in the general court rather than having one specialized court. Um, we also see a uh, 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 lack of support uh, there uh, for environmental courts and tribunal, and then there's more support for general court. Uh, so uh, things just uh, 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 happen, and it's, it's, it's also very hard for, um, uh, for the country itself if, if they are still uh, being challenged with a lot of environmental cases. Um, I suppose, uh, I suppose uh, developing countries, uh, I will not name names, but developing countries are struggling with this more rather than developed countries. Usually changes in developed countries uh, in terms of closing and opening uh, courts are you know, rather rare, although we see that in, in, in Ferris and her team's work also, uh, we have seen uh, changes like that in Europe. But uh, in developing countries, uh, uh, things like this happen uh, more often with changing of government uh, usually because and then uh, the priorities change. Thank you very much Linda and um, now I would just like to direct everyone's attention to the question and answer box just to let everyone know that um, some of our attendees have actually shared very interesting insights about their region so we have some comments about um, the Hawaii ECTs um, and we also have some comments about how Sierra Leone has benefited from capacity building initiatives and we also have one new comment from Prof Ben Boa about a book, an upcoming book that might be of interest to anybody else who wants to um, find out more about environmental courts and tribunals. Um, let me just answer this. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, we heard about this from Gita also uh, yesterday that uh, Judge uh, Brian Preston and uh, the team, uh, the author team has just launched this very new book on uh, environmental law in action. Uh, that's also very important for uh, ECTs. Uh, I suppose it will be good if we can get, you know, the copies and start reading from cover to cover. Yeah, so thank you very much for sharing all those insights with us. And we have one more question from Yao Wen Zheng of the Center of International Law. She would like to know, what are the main obstacles, if any, for the enforcement of decisions or wards by ECTs? Are they possible to be enforced overseas given that states can refuse to enforce them on the grounds of national interest or public interest? So um, Farah, Linda, would you like to share anything that you might have discovered during your research? Farah, you wanna go? I think Beatrice yes. also can answer this very well. Oh yes, sure, for sure. Thank you. Well, yes, the example that I mentioned, um, we, as we understand it, the um, a special court for the fight against Rosewood in Madagascar is, has overseas competence for uh, the trafficking of these types of wood. Um, but yes, this can get quite complicated from an international law point of view. Um, enforcement of decisions of ECTs are uh, very important because this is really the end of the of the chain, and we see that also in Belgium. Uh, this is not um, not easy. Um, enforcement of decisions of our environmental courts are being followed up by the Attorney General, uh, in part, in part by the Finance Department for um, the fines. And this, this doesn't work very well um, often in Belgium due to a lack of people and uh, capacity. As I said, it is, um, uh, it is a challenge also in de developed countries. So I, I don't know if the colleagues have other insights. Well, from what we see in the Caribbean, um, uh, we found uh, like several articles, even highlighting, uh, you know, the non-enforcement reality of environmental jurisprudence in the area and also um, some countries in uh, Southeast Asia is uh, having the same um, 
having the same problem. So everything looks good on the paper, but in reality, it's not like that. Um, Beatrice, you wanna share something? Thank you, Linda. I think that's a very good question. I actually think this is an area where further research is required mm -hmm. because we hear so much about what is happening, the climate change litigation, all these new cases, but we don't know so much what is happening, happening next, if they are being enforced, uh, what is the practical um, value of those decisions, um, particularly, I think, in climate change uh, litigation. And it is, as Farah mentioned, is, it is a big issue for developing countries. Um, so uh, thinking about the to-do list for next, I think that's definitely an area where further work is required. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, that was, thank you very much for those answers. That was a, a difficult question indeed. Um, so now we would like to have another question answered. So we have a question from Associate Prof. Vincent Joel. Prowl, I'm sorry if I've pronounced your name wrongly, but um, thank you very much for your questions. He would like to ask a couple. Um, so firstly, what is the relevance of ongoing developments in the transnational business and human rights or corporate social responsibility agenda um, towards the framework that has been canvassed in the guide and moving forward? And secondly, he would like to know, um, the guide discusses general court judges trained in environmental law, especially in the context of SLAP cases, which is basically the strategic litigation against um, participation in policy. So he mentions that there is a 2020 Nevsan decision um, featuring the, that, that came out of the Supreme Court of Canada which appears to have opened the door to suing corporations for extraterritorial human rights abuses before domestic courts. So if Canada's controversial approach, he writes here, gains traction in other jurisdictions, how helpful will it be to the work of ECTs? So to summarize, I think his first question was, what is the relevance of ongoing human rights, corporate governance um, developments, in relation to the development of ECTs. And secondly, with regards that, with regards cases like that specific case from Canada, how would um, human rights approaches be helpful or complementary to the work of ECTs? Um, this is open for any panelist who would like to answer. Uh, I'll I'll do the first step and then maybe Arnold can uh, answer the hardest part. <laughs> but I think uh, the, the, UN, uh, the UNBHR um, is, is, is very important in terms of you know, giving more guideline of what's going on in the business and human rights world for ECTs. Specifically, uh, we've seen in, in cases that, you know, that we could uh, put our hands on during the research, there are um, a lot of cases with companies' uh, involvement, um, um, you know, on human rights, uh, uh, between human rights and environment uh, overlap uh, within the case. So uh, with, you know, like new instruments going on from, from uh, U the UN or any other uh, authoritative uh, agencies, uh, international agencies, it will be good for any ECTs in the world uh, you know, to have more guides on because like these things are happening uh, every day and the cases are piling up every day. And if we can have like more guidance, even though they're not legally binding, uh, I think it will be good uh, for, for, for all the ECTs in the world. And uh, regarding SLAP uh, cases, uh, I think uh, only several countries in the world has put like slap case um, avoidance in their statutory statutory uh, uh, law, like the Philippines, I know that for sure. In Indonesia, we have that in the constitution, uh, in um, and several other countries in um, in in uh, in Asia Pacific. But I'm not quite sure uh, with North America, 
you know, whether uh, Canada could, uh, open open uh, their um, controversial ap approach that would presumably capture environmental wrong. So um, this is, I think, open for uh, interpret interpretation uh, from uh, other panelists here. Thank you, Linda. You have uh, put me on the spot somewhat. I'll, I'll try to, to do my best. Um, in terms of uh, self-regulation, uh, that I find very interesting. And, and a lot of the points that, that you have raised in your question, I think uh, we could note down for uh, perhaps emphasis in, in a future report because they're all increasingly relevant in terms of trends that we should monitor. But of course, um, as Linda has said, these things are not uh, legally binding, but at the same time, you know, I believe in administrative law, there's also uh, principles that, uh, you know, what you decided as an administrative body yourself that you would adhere to in terms of policies and procedures, you are also then uh, obliged to follow under law. Uh, but I don't have the data if this is something that increasingly also features before environmental courts and tribunals, or if there are some jurisdictions that have the wherewithal to, uh, to make such self-regulation and also stick in a case that comes, uh, that comes before them. Um, but again, I think there are analogies from, from administrative law uh, that, could be, uh, that could be brought to bear here. The slab cases, uh, this is a, a worrying trend that uh, UNEP is also monitoring in the context of, uh, of course, environmental rights uh, broadly and especially environmental defenders. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, this adds complexity, this adds challenges to uh, overall create a legal system that is able to cater to environmental uh, issues adequately because often slab cases are then brought uh, not in an environmental court or tribunal but in a, a general, general court so then the judges need to make the connection to really understand what is behind this uh, this case so this brings uh, added challenges we are of course uh, advocating for anti-slab uh, legislation because we see this as an increasing trend uh, but we're also hopeful uh, that um, the, the increased attention to environmental cases and increased environmental activism uh, also legally around the world will help prevent a wave of slap cases. Uh, in other words, that, uh, you know, these slap cases are, uh, you know, readily visible for, for what they really are. Uh, that I think is the key here, but uh, it also necessitates more general awareness among judges around environmental issues, which then also boils down again to environmental education uh, for judges and general uh, law curricula need to uh, have an emphasis on this because uh, as we have seen, environmental cases are now impacting perhaps not only on environmental courts and tribunals, but uh, through the slap cases also uh, in other uh, other uh, uh, courts uh, that uh, at least need to be aware of uh, the basic uh, environmental uh, framework that is at play here, so that they can be aware of uh, uh, of uh, some some uh, uh, concerns that uh, that might uh, that might uh, be at, at play here. And then I'm not. I have to admit I'm not familiar with uh, with the the Canadian uh, proposal, but uh, as others have said before, uh, I am uh, convinced that uh, you know extraterritorial jurisdiction is something that we hear about, but we might need to, to do more research on it, particularly also around enforcement, because it's one thing to proclaim it, uh, it's another thing, uh, of course, uh, to make it stick. But as far as I have said, we have anecdotal evidence around the world that some uh, uh, jurisdiction have uh, uh, been receiving this, uh, this uh, uh, authority, but uh, what difference does it make in practice? I think that's uh, what we over the next few years uh, need to investigate. That's, uh, that's all I can, I can add on these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold and Linda. Uh, yes, Farah, I think you wanted to say something. 
Yes, if I may add uh, two, two um, considerations from a European perspective. I think that the extraterritorial uh, competence is um, regulated under the national um, criminal procedure or civil procedure law of each country, but that um, it, this is an interesting feature for ECTs which are which exist or are to be established, namely the extraterritorial competence in cases like wildlife or wood trafficking. So we can add this to the list of, uh, of good practices. And uh, on the other hand, as a criminal lawyer, I must say that um, uh, in a next report, we could uh, examine further um, the li liability of companies. Um, because even in Europe, there are uh, countries which do not have liability of companies in their criminal uh, procedure law. Uh, although the Euro Environmental Crime Directive of the European Union and now the new proposal for this directive, because it's going to be replaced they oblige every member state to provide for liability of, um, of companies. And it can be criminal or administrative liability. And there is even a list of minimum sanctions that have to be uh, provided for in the member states legislation, uh, such as, and I think that will be very effective and deterring the publication of environmental decisions uh, regarding a company, the dissolution of companies and uh, fines which will be lin linked to the turnover of companies. So uh, we are waiting for the new environmental crime directive to be adopted uh, this autumn, I think. But uh, yes, I think liability of uh, corporations is, an, an, an is very important in environmental uh, justice. And it is also an aspect that we could uh, research further. On the other hand, we could also have a look at, our, because I think when environmental courts and tribunals are not well functioning or are non-existing, uh, co companies turn to arbitration. And then it would be interesting to research whether there are uh, arbitration bodies uh, specialized in environment. Uh, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Farah, and thank you again to all the panelists for your presentations and your answers to complicated questions. Um, unfortunately, uh, to our audience, unfortunately, the Q&A has closed. Uh, we will be closing our Q&A and wrapping up the session because it is now 5.40 or so, 5.41 p.m. Singapore time. So we have come to the end of our webinar for today. But before we leave, we would just like to extend our heartfelt thanks again to everybody for taking the time out of your schedule to attend this official launch. Um, it is our honor to have prepared this report for everyone. And we strongly encourage everyone to read the report um, for more detailed insights and facts um, about our research and about individual jurisdictions. And if you do have more questions that you would like to ask, um, perhaps you could reach out to the panelists individually and they have left their contacts uh, during the presentations. So with that, again, thank you very much to everybody. Um, if you could please help us to fill up this feedback form, your feedback is highly appreciated and we will be using it to improve our subsequent webinars. So once again, thank you very much for joining us, especially if you're in a time zone where it's the very early morning or the very late at night. Um, thank, thank you, you very so much, much again. Thank you, everybody.